All right, if everybody could please take their seats. We're gonna get started here in just a minute. All right, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out to the final session of the day. I think you're in for a real treat. Um, we have six really great speakers um, for this last integrative research review panel. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kevin Leander, who is the moderator for the session. So. Thank you, Sasha. This is um, um, this has been kind of a work in progress for a while, and we're excited that we're able to do this this morning. I, I just wanted to give you a little bit of history, and then I'm going to introduce you to the writer and artist, David Landry. Um, but um, some months ago, I was um, at an exhibit in a part of Nashville that's called the Fort Houston area, which is an area that's uh, kind of gentrifying, I think, in a good way. Um, a lot of warehouse areas that are turning into artist spaces and maker spaces and this kind of thing. And came, uh, heard about this exhibit that you see part of behind me based upon this graphic novel, The Anomaly, that David has written and, and created and painted. And um, to give you a sense of the scale, I think David might give you a sense of it, um, it would, this work would probably, if laid out, would at least cover that back wall of this room. It's a, a, a large, a very large composition and I was struck by um, the, in the opening sort of gala, I think I, this was the second time that I had seen it in the, in the gala event, how, how event-like it was, this, this reading. Uh, event-like in the sense that people were engaging in the text as, as a story, engaging in the text as pictures, but also with costumed actors, uh, actresses uh, roaming around objects, some of which you see behind me, which were models for the painting and which were present in the space. So you had this materiality of objects, materiality of costumes and bodies, engagement with the text and the story. Um, and I was struck by my own sort of disorientation and orientations and kind of moving across the scene of the text and trying to make sense of it and experience, experiencing it, sometimes breathlessly, breathlessly so just sort of having my breath taken away by so much to think about and so much to experience. Um, I think that one of the cool things about this text too, I'm not sure we'll be able to get into it today, but there was a, there's a, a lot of play with time and space in the representational features of the text. And then of course the play of time and space and the experience of the text being this very large composition that really captured my imagination. And um, as we were having some conversations with Becky Rogers and others at LRA, we said, what if we could bring uh, David and his work here into this space to start to think about multimodality together in some new ways and open up this box of multimodality in some new ways. And um, I, I, that's what we're able to do this morning. And I'm really excited about this session. I'm very excited about the set of uh, presenters that we have, and I'm thankful to them for uh, agreeing to do this and to think about uh, this um, this work with us, this experience, and this event with us. And uh, with that, I want to um, turn over to David, who's going to tell you a little bit about the history of this work and his own perspectives on it. Um, which, uh, and after David uh, shares, I'll come back and share a few thoughts, give a sense of overview of the presenters, and a, a few thoughts that are on my mind. And then we'll, we'll move on from there with four presenters, each giving an interpretation of, uh, of the work. And um, after those four presenters, we'll have some time for, for questions, OK? All right, thank you for coming this morning. <laughs> Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I would like to thank Kevin, Rebecca, and Sasha, and everyone uh, here at the LRA uh, for having me here. Um, I am both honored and humbled to be accepted by so many academic scholars. I never imagined while writing all of the terrible puns into the dialogue of the anomaly um, that I would be invited to speak at a literary conference regarding that graphic novel. And I wanted to um, also thank um, our presenters here for uh, enduring those puns. Um. <laughs> Sorry, trying to figure out my slides. Um, oh, 
Bones up after this. Oh, okay. <clears throat> uh, my passion for sequential art began as soon, I was, soon as I was able to read. Even as a young kid, I was inspired by the idea of telling a narrative with a medium that uses visual art, literary elements, auditory triggers through onomatopoeia, and welcomes the reader into the narrative process through the use of panels. The author, Scott McLeod, put it best when he wrote, the heart of comics lies in the spaces between the panels, where the reader's imagination makes the still pictures come alive. <clears throat> the invisible spaces between the panels of a comic book are just as essential as the illustrated panels themselves. You, the reader, completes the story by filling in the blanks with your own experiences and knowledge. Each individual has a different experience between the panels. That is the magic of sequential art. It is not complete until you read it. Sequential art is not perfect by any means. Critical observation of traditional American comics have shown its propensity towards violence, sexism, and inflexibility in a Caucasian male-dominated genre of literature. I'm one of them. In recent years, though, great innovators such as Art Spiegelman, Alex Ross, G. Willow Wilson, and Neil Gaiman have made big leaps towards diversifying both the audience and the subject matter of sequential art. As a comic artist, I was frustrated to find a lack of interest in our libraries and surprised that the fine art world considered comic art to be lowbrow. In 2011, I took that frustration and I turned it into a challenge to bridge the gap between the world of high art and the often misunderstood medium of sequential art. I conceived of a very ambitious project, a life-size graphic novel. Uh, Kevin talked a little bit, um, mentioned the, the scale of it. Um, it possibly could wrap around this in, entire building. There's, there's actually only one art gallery that I know of the Frist here in Nashville that can house the size of my graphic novel. Uh, when it went on display in February, it was actually, to my research, uh, the largest single show of visual art that's ever come into this city. It's uh, 321 individual paintings of these size. So, very ambitious. <laughs> um, if art galleries would not display traditional comic art, then I would trick high society into reading a comic book by painting its panels on large canvases that I would hang on gallery walls as fine art. But simply making a comic book bigger was not enough for me. My project needed to be a brand new experience. I wanted to interject, inject, sorry, greater multimodality into sequential art than had ever been experienced before. The traditional blank spaces between panels became three-dimensional levels between my paintings. The characters were ripped from the pages and became real tangible costumes that the reader can interact with. Every detail of the story would surround the reader in a fully immersive environment. Creating the anomaly was nearly a five-year project and required the help of all of my friends at Abrasive Media. Um, so all of the characters in the story are all of my friends and family that modeled, um, including myself. Um, I'm actually Nikola Tesla in the story um, and several other characters. It was really fun working with um, all of my friends and dressing them up in costume. My wife here, Kelly, helped um, sew and create the costumes. And we'd just show up after work and photograph ourselves. Um, we'd set up lighting 
and um, I had my sister Anna, who's a photographer, come and, and shoot us, and then I made the paintings based off of the um, photographs in order to create as much realism in the paintings as I could, and also it allowed me to approach the canvas um, almost in an impressionistic um, way, um, because I wasn't in approaching it like a um, like a comic artist where I'd make it up out of my head, I was more approaching it as a fine artist um, where I was evaluating the way that light was interacting um, in what I was seeing and translating that onto the canvases. <clears throat> Working with such a diverse group of artists helped me help to challenge my perception. Sorry. Let me see. Working with such a diverse group of artists helped to challenge my preconceived notions about diversity. Rather than simply painting a range of colors into my own stories, I needed to seek out the words of other cultures and tell their stories as well. I love that about art. It inspires us to think critically. It inspires us to think critically and allows us to embrace our differences. I am sure that the panel will talk more about the uh, changes made to the real life characters such as Sarah Bernhardt and turning Nikola Tesla's uh, sister into a male twin. Some of those changes were made to help diversify the cast of characters during the creative process. Not all of those changes ended up being for the best. And uh, I might have, like, if I did it again, I, I might change some of those, because I've, I've learned a lot in the process um, about diversity and um, about looking at each other's stories and each other's words and not just applying our ideas of what we perceive other people into our words, but rather embracing the words of others as well. I've found that to be very important. Um, and so I think that those are some, some things that I might, if I did it again today, change about my story, um, the way that I wrote it, um, is my perception of what diversity is has changed through um, the creative process. And, and, and I, I learned a lot myself uh, while working on it. Um, I guess I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the use of, of space and time um, in it. So, uh, the, my graphic novel is, are we good with time here a little bit? Okay, uh, so my graphic novel is, uh, is set in a genre uh, called steampunk. And uh, a lot of steampunk I've noticed is hot gluing cogs onto things um, and then calling it steampunk. And that's always bothered me. And so I thought about, well, okay, so I'm writing a story about Nikola Tesla, so how do I create a steampunk world um, with this character from real life who is basically the grandfather of our modern um, technology in, in society? And so I thought, well, what if Nikola Tesla was removed from society, from history, before he was able to invent all these great things that we depend on today? wouldn't that change the way that um, our technology advanced? And so that's what I did in my story, is I created um, this device called the Rubicon that removes people from history for brief periods of time. Um, and so what ended up happening in the story was because Nikola Tesla wasn't able to create these inventions that he had, um, it created a steampunk society that was based more off of um, uh, technology that was not progressing as it, as it did in our time. I hope that uh, some, if not all of you, had a chance uh, during this, during yesterday, I guess was when it was on display, to go through and, um, and read some of the story and that was on display here. If not, I think that there'll be a, a chance um, to go through and read it um, during this discussion, during this panel. Um, when you do so, I would like you to take the time to, sorry, let me skip a couple slides here, um, to also observe how other people interact with an immersive environment. That's one thing that really impressed on me that I really loved 
about this display is seeing how other people interact with it, um, seeing the, the differences in each other. And that was really amazing to me. That really touched me. Um, because there were so many different ways that people, I, I saw people, you know, getting on the ground and reading it and, and hugging each other. I've seen people walk through and like read it out loud to each other while they, I mean, it's just incredible. It was something that really just struck me that I, I wasn't prepared for. Um, is just the, the differences in us and, and how amazing that is and how it can bring us together. Um, that's one thing that art really does is, is it, it, it breaks down barriers. Uh, because it's something that we all love experiencing, but we experience it in different ways. And having an, an immersive environment, um, all of our, our borders are broken down. We're, we're with other people and we're surrounded by it and we can experience it together in our own ways. And so I think it'd be great if uh, while you're reading through it, if you also observe how other people also experience it and, and see what that does to you and, and, and how that makes you feel about our fellow mankind. Thank you. So we're not going to um, take time during the session to actually look at this, but if you have to catch a plane and you need to do that, we're just going to keep moving on. You just kind of up, up here and like wander around and look at this. We're fine. Um, we, um, I was just thinking as David was talking about Louise Rosenblatt's, um, you know, aesthetic and efferent readings, and I was thinking about the experience in reading this. So this is a very complicated story, and, and, and it's, it's, it's not an easy story to understand. And so from the efferent side of trying to have something to take away, right, in that sort of literal meaning of efferent, um, I was really motivated, still am motivated to understand something, but also aesthetically engaged. So I thought it was really interesting for me in this experience to feel both of those simultaneously. Like, I want to understand this thing. So traversing it back and forth and going up and down and coming in and out of the text and um, at the same time, like I said, the kind of like the breathtaking sense of I'm in some big world here that's moving me and there's objects and there's beautiful art and there's beautiful color. Um, I want to be able to, as we move here along, to give you a, a brief sense, a overview, big picture sense of what you'll be seeing from the other presenters, a little snapshot view, and then to just make a few comments. Um, the first presenter will be um, Jennifer Roselle. And um, <clears throat> what Jennifer is going to do is to, Jennifer, of course, has been somebody who's contributed so much to our own understandings of multimodality. And so Jennifer is going to sort of begin from a historical perspective and thinking about her own formation in social semiotics and thinking about what is, what that has given us as a history and where she feels she wants to go with it now and what's sort of missing for her and um, talk about this idea of movements from a path and drawing on um, the work of Tim Ingold and sort of thinking about, which seems like such an appropriate metaphor for us and, and thinking about a journey, um, uh, a, a walk along a, through a multimodal experience and the experiences of the walk that are not trajectory-like but are this kind of meandering walk that Ingold talks about in terms of our nature of experience. So that's where Jennifer's gonna, gonna take us. Um, um, after Jennifer, um, um, Sturge Blitzakis will be talking and, and Sturge is going to focus some on reading comprehension and Sturge has brought to us a lot of work really focused on the graphic novel itself. So he's uh, a, a genre expert really on, the, on graphic novels and he's going to think with us about the complexities of reading uh, graphic novels, some of which David already began to, to talk about a bit in terms of the gaps between the frames and so on. And so Sturge is going to talk some about the visual um, and uh, verbal sort of combinations and, and, and pathways of readers in reading the graphic novel and draw on a range of work um, including uh, social semiotics and uh, the work of, uh, uh, brought together by Serafini coming from uh, media literacy and, and other places. Um, next, um, very excited to have with us also uh, Simi Aziz. Uh, Simi will be doing 
uh, work that is the closest to a critical textual analysis, especially drawing from post-colonial theory. And so I think this is so interesting for us in terms of thinking about the world outside of the text or the world of the experience of the text and the world inside the text, the representational world, those worlds not being separated, but what does this representational world, who interacts in it, who is being made here, how are power relations playing across the surface of the, of the text, drawing primarily on the work of Said and others with imaginative, imaginative geographies, sorry, and uh, thinking about um, uh, Orientalism, thinking about um, uh, a post-colonial um, reading of the text as a critical frame. Um, and then the last presenter will be Christian Eret, um, who's um, going to um, take us from this, uh, take us further into this, this idea of sort of the juxtaposition of multimodality as we've experienced it, we've inherited it from social semiotics and to thinking about um, critiques of multimodality, drawing uh, among others from the work of Masumi, Deleuze and Guattari, and to think about, um, and I'm going to just read a quote here, how the signs of art in particular are the object of embodied, rhythmic, and effective apprenticeships of sensation. Thinking about how do we come into sensa sensation? How does, um, how is this a form of apprenticeship uh, into the singular experience of sensation of a work? Um, and so Christian will unpack for you the meaning of this image um, um, because I want it to be his, so I'm gonna leave that to him. So. Um, that's, that's the sense of the, of the session, those four, those four um, different presentations. Um, just to, before they begin, just to um, add a few notes of thoughts that I had, and um, these obviously are talks that go in very different directions. They can't be broad. There's no grand theory here. There's no singular perspective, but there's a desire to open up something around multimodality. And one, a few thoughts about openings that I would like to um, sort of start with is to begin with, First of all, this um, idea about how our theories of reading begin with the boundaries of reader text and, and what else is possible. Um, um, thinking with you about this idea of, from Deleuze and Guattari, about, of the assemblage, and of the assemblage that's coming together as the reader's body interacts with the body of the text, and, and another assemblage that's the um, enunciation or language, the bringing together of language with content, materials, and conceptual bodies in the text. So um, the title of the slide, I said there's at least three bodies in the event of reading. And I'm picking up a little bit on, um, again, going back to, to Rosenblatt, thinking about uh, reader response, thinking about this interaction of the person in the text. From the poem as event, Rosenblatt says, first of all, each reader was active. He was not a blank tape registering a ready-made message. He was actively involved in building up a poem for himself out of his responses to the text. He had to draw on his past experiences with the verbal symbols. He had to select from the various alternative reference that occurred to him. To do this, he had to find some context within which these references could be related. He sometimes found it necessary to reinterpret early, earlier parts of the text in the light of later parts. Actually, he had not fully read the first line until he had read the last and interrelated them. There was a kind of shuttling back and forth as one or another synthesizing element, a context, a persona, a level of meaning suggested itself to him. And of course, this are, these are thoughts and amazing thoughts as we think about them coming from the poem as event um, that we still think about in the event of reading, right? And so I want to sort of put that before us as this responsiveness that we brought to the act of reading, but also ask a couple questions about it. First of all, these insights came, as you, you can picture Louise Rosenblatt, watching a person with a text on a tabletop, watching a, a reader and a text, with the definition of a text being the book laying open or the page open on the top of the table, and the reader peering over the, the text and struggling with the text and some, making corrections going back into the text. But that text and that body is a certain kind of body and is a certain kind of text at a certain kind of moment in history, a certain kind of relationship. It's a body that's mostly still. It's a body that's mostly sitting at a table. It's a text that's mostly on the page and on the tabletop. And I want to think about that as a moment that brings to us a certain kind of insight about reading, but that itself is situated in a certain kind of practice that has its own gift to us, coming to us from history, but has its own limits to us in terms of how we imagine reading, how we imagine the body, 
how we imagine the text, and how we imagine the assemblages that come from that moment where the two come together. In literacy studies, we might also ask how reading as an assemblage may have been organized in an entirely different way, or may be organized in a different way, with different configurations of social bodies, human bodies, and textual materials. Engaging at this pre-assemblage level provides clues to how to open up current practices through no, new virtual relationships that are not yet conceived as the possible. I want to talk a little bit also about giant and, uh, giant and tiny texts. <laughs> and I already mentioned this a little bit, like how have our, how have our theories of reading domesticated textual size and scale? Um, Bruno Latour, the sociologist, the French sociologist, used to say that when social scientists talk about context, they usually sketch with their hands something in the air about the size and shape of a pumpkin. And so maybe the poem is our pumpkin. Maybe the poem is our pumpkin. Maybe that's what we think the context is, or maybe that's how we think the size of a text is, what a size looks like. Um, big text might include a cityscape, immersive virtual reality environments, augmented realities, or networks. And thinking about what it would it mean to read a network as a practice of reading? And why might you do that in this political time? Why might you think about reading a network instead of a page? Small text might be the chromosome or the code or Borges' Aleph. Uh, when Borges talks about the Aleph, he talks about the tiny place where the whole world collapses. He says on the back part of the step toward the, this is from his short story, the Aleph. On the back part of the step toward the right, I saw a small iridescent sphere of almost unbearable brilliance. At first I thought it was revolving. Then I realized that this was the movement that this movement was an illusion created by the dizzying world it bounded. The Aleph's diameter was probably little more than an inch, but all space was there, actual and undiminished. Each thing was infinite things, since I distinctly saw it from every angle of the universe. I saw the teeming sea, I saw daybreak and nightfall, I saw the multitudes of America, I saw a silvery cobweb in the center of a black pyramid, I saw a splintered labyrinth, it was London. I saw, close up, unending eyes watching themselves in me as in a mirror. I saw all the mirrors on earth and none of them reflecting me. I saw in a backyard of Solar Street the same tiles that 30 years before I'd seen in the entrance of a house in Fray Bentos. And he goes on. So this idea of the whole world in the small, and in some ways you see these sort of collapsings of the world into the small, into these kind of openings that David is also providing in this work. Um, so how do we think about giant, giant and tiny texts, both the giant and tiny, materially speaking, and the ways in which texts um, recontextualize the giant and the tiny, or create openings into the giant and to the tiny? Finally, I wanted to think about this idea of scaling and modality. Um, we can think about this, um, this notion in terms of um, um, how how do we engage in modality and how are our bodies scaled in relationship to text and what tools do we use to scale with relationship to text differently? How are modality and scaling related as social practices of the body text relationship? We use different kinds of tools or embodied tools and practices of embodied meaning making and experiences across scale. What tools, what virtual tools and what uh, technical tools and other tools do we use to rescale our bodies, to become bigger than the physical human bodies that we've been given in our approaches to text? And how do we scale toward the small? How does schooling scale the body? What kinds of bodies come out of school just like what kinds of texts come out of school? And what's possible? How is the school textual body relationship essentially a fundamental formation of school? That we, what you, if you learn mostly in school how to do school, how, how does the doing of reading a schooling of the body and a schooling of the text? Lewis Carroll, um, Sylvie and Bruno, um, I'm sorry, the work Sylvie and Bruno concluded tells of a fantasy map that had the scale of a mile to a mile. All right? Fantasy map, the scale of a mile to a mile. Um, Borges wrote a short story about a map made to a one to one scale. It's an homage to Lewis Carroll's work mentioned, uh, uh, that I just mentioned. Um, uh, the story is called On Exactitude in Science, and it's collected in a universal history of infamy. Um, Stephen Wright, the comedian, you like Stephen Wright? Yeah, gotta love Stephen Wright. 
claim that um, Borges uh, imagination was not detailed enough and he planned to obtain another map in which the foot of space in real life was represented by three feet on the map. Um, Stephen Wright's joke and Borges story sort of give us this sense that uh, that there's a range of possibilities in these embodied modalities and the representations and even in sort of absurdist renderings of them. But I think this idea that we have different sensory and sociocultural practices uh, among people and among our scaled relationships to text is something that we should hold on to and, and not see as simply set as uh, in stone as a practice once and for all, but that new possibilities are being opened up, including by this work that David's presenting to us today. I want to now um, transition to Jennifer. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I wanted to thank Kevin Leander for inviting me to be part of this exciting panel. Um, it's, it's exciting to think of LRA embracing these kinds of alternative sessions. Um, so thank you so much, Kevin. So uh, I'm going to take seriously David's call, um, David Landry's call in your talk, uh, your opening talk, to enfold your own interpretation into the anomaly. And so what reading the book, the graphic story made me think of is it made me think a little bit of my own history, I, not to be narcissistic, but just to think about uh, being in multimodality for 20 years, what it, what it feels like and where we've, got, where we've been and where we're going to. Hence the title, Crossing Histories, Revisiting Rubicons. And what I'm trying to say in this title is that we've, we're, there have been a series of different phases within multimodality, and I think we have to be respectful of the lineages that, they've, that they are, and think about the Rubicons we've passed and where we are now. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. Uh, this is um, a quote from the Anomaly, the book, uh, that kind of exemplifies what I want to say, which is we are nowhere and everywhere. Think of this as a gateway. And indeed, I think that that's where we are with multimodality. I think that it's a bit messy right now. I think we have a lot of different enfolding concepts coming into multimodality, which is exciting and is generative. But I think we're also everywhere. And um, we want to start thinking about how can we bring this all together in a cohesive way, and I think it's exciting. I think it, I think it is a gateway. Um, and I think to really understand the anomaly, we need a number of things in addition to multimodality. So one needs a sense of space, spatiality, one needs a sense of histories and time, and that's certainly in the story. Um, Christian will talk about affect and embodiment, but we have to have that. And materialism, and I have this funny little comment here, just because I want to include that verb. Um, emotion trumps logic, um, in that what I'm trying to say here is that there is a focus in things like Crescent Van Leeuwen's uh, The Grammar of Visual Design about technical things, right? Grammars, um, structures, and that's important, but it's always about emotion, right? What lies behind the production and design of text has to do with that ephemeral matter that, that is about the heart and about being human in the world. So I want you to think about that as, as I talk. So when I hark back to where I started in 1997, I started with Bryan Street and, uh, and Gunter Kress. And so those early days were, were a coupling and a braiding together of an ethnographic gaze to look at text and the production of text and stuff and materials and how they came together, um, complemented by Gunter Kress. And, I think that's an important coupling, certainly for me and I think for other people, because what it, is, it does is it gives that emotional, human, idiosyncratic stuff that we, that we have that's materialized into something. And that's the beauty of combining them, I think. Um, and that's been very special for me, and I felt very lucky to have that time in my, in my life. And so we're in a state of becoming, uh, to, to use, um, you know, think of Deleuze and Guattari and others, uh, Ellsworth, uh, and, and we're in a state of, of, of a series, we've had a series of turns, certainly over the last 15 years, so I've talked about this before. We've had a design turn, we had a convergence turn with new literacies and um, Noble and Lancashire, we had a temporal turn, I see, I see Kathy Compton Lilly, Jay Lemke, we had a spatial turn, affect turn, post-human turn, materialism turn, maker turn, so I mean these are contemporaneous things, but that's a lot. Um, and often multimodality, I, maybe this is fair to say, someone can shoot me down later, but I think it's an overarching concept, orientation to literacy. 
So contemporary multimodality is a whole bunch of things. So when I look at my teenager, I see her being emotional on Instagram. I see her being playful in house party with all her friends. So it's about how young people use spaces and convergences and cosmopolitanism, right? They're local global people. Um, they use materialities. They certainly think of objects as agentive. Uh, there's aesthetics in there. Uh, Kevin talked about that. There's temporality. There's obviously design. So these are circulating in, in, in our notions of multimodality. Um, but the other thing that I've emphasized over the years, I hope, is that you have to have a respect for the craft, right, of making. I don't usually use the term making. I usually talk about production and design. But I think for a long time, I've, I've respected professionals like David, right? There's a lot of skill that goes along with it, and it's not easy. And that skill involves, let's say, comic as a genre, for example. I can only name a few choices you had, right? You had to choose an illustration style and, and the way to, and to create frames in a graphic story. You had to think about your color palette, right? It emotes. You had to think about temporal sequencing. You had to think about costumes, artifacts, objects, spatial or orchestrations, the written narrative. You had to think about, and then what seems like minor things like font orientation, trim size, the gutter the sa and sounds, and then you have the materiality of that room. Lots and lots of choices behind the scenes that are rendered invisible, okay? So I'm gonna shift to In Gold because what I like about In Gold is that I'm a little scared of Deleuze and Qatari. I don't feel smart enough to be able to tackle them. So what I went with In Gold because In Gold feels loose, right? In Gold feels like you can, you can work with his ontology and make it work with multimodality. Now I chose this particular quote because it's gonna to relate to a research study I'm gonna talk about. If the same tract is trodden often enough, the many individual prints merge into a continuous path. One cannot then read individual movements from a path, but only those commonly or collectively made. Footprints are individual, paths are social. Now what do I mean by that? When David created the anomaly, David created it, but he also talked about the social map of his text, right? He made the footprints, but you had a collective that, were, that was part of the production. Is that fair to say? Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna talk about a research study I conducted in June and July with a group of homeless um, youth uh, with addiction and mental health issues. Now these were 15 individuals uh, ranging in the age of 16 to 25. And the study in was, was fairly simple. It involved three, over six weeks, three multimodal projects. Photography, movement, and drama and mask making. Now, Dr. Carolyn Winters did the drama and mask making. The movement was Glenis McQueen Fuentes, and I did the photography uh, unit with a PhD student, Terry uh, Trezcek. And so I'm gonna talk about the photography project in relation to this notion of footprints and, um, and pathways. So this is something that um, Beatrice created. Now, Beatrice is 18, and she is currently homeless and has had mental health and addiction issues. Now, we, what we asked them to do is to create a triptych and of three different photographs that work together cohesively. Now, the reason I chose this is because what Beatrice talked about is looking at this as seeing her, her community differently. So the, the, the project was called Rolling in the Deep, after the Adele song, and uh, seeing differently. So seeing your community in a different light. So they had cameras and they would go around to the immediate community and take photographs of things they, th they see all the time. And so she goes by this particular tree, doesn't give it a second thought, but she did a close-up, right? And something happens when the lens goes very close into something. So she saw the moss and the bark, and it started to become um, metaphorical for her. So I'm calling that material experiencing, okay? The middle picture is a picture of a staircase with her best friend in the staircase. And with the sunlight coming down, it had a feeling of hope. So it was, it was, it was affect-laden. All right, and then the final one is posthuman because she often passes these flowers again, never gives them a second thought, but they became agentive for her when she saw them, you know, in, in a lens, in a camera lens. I went by that very quickly because of time, but that, that project really, um, it changed me in ways, in many ways. Working with a population that I'd never worked with changed me, absolutely, but also thinking about multimodality this way. How's my time? Be out of time. Am I out of time? Don't worry. Okay. It's about becoming rather than being. All right. Um, I love this quote because it's about in process. So I would have loved to have seen how David created the anomaly. Right. I would have loved to have taken photographs as he created the canvases. And so I've seen this time and again in my work 
with young people. Now you'll note that these are mostly males. Um, I have noticed a personal pattern with males I've worked with over the, over the years, and young people as, as makers, I think of them as designers, and I have a lot of respect for them. I have a lot of respect for the invisible, untapped skills that they have, and I'm sad that they don't get to um, realize them in school. So the first maker is a young man who loves skateboarding, didn't really want to do this assignment. He had to create a conceptual photograph in the style of Cindy Sherman. And so he created this beautiful photograph in his uh, skateboard park. He knew what he was going to wear. He knew when he, where he was going to take the photograph. He knew what his look would be. And he knew the written narrative. It was very clear to him. Okay? So for someone who said that he didn't want to do it and to have such clarity and such vision was quite powerful. Then Jafar. Jafar did a, um, had a rant. We had podcasts he had to create, and he talked about how expensive running shoes are. But he did it in a masterful, funny way. The third maker is Cole, who's into Minecraft and spends hours of the day creating Minecraft worlds and curating information about Minecraft. He's an autodidact, and he designs these incredible worlds in Minecraft. And then finally, Ahmed, who did a video on 9-11, and it was a short documentary that was assignment in our media class. And again, it was beautifully made. He did it about a hundred times. I kept saying, Ahmed, you got it. You have to commit here. So he did finally produce something. And these are these to me are makers. They're designers in very exciting ways. And the designers that are, um, as I said, rendered silent in school. Um, and they do this in the corners of their lives that we don't really know about. So to conclude, are we everywhere and nowhere? I think it's a very exciting time for multimodality. I think I have worries and insecurities as a researcher. I feel impoverished with my methods. I don't feel I have the methods to cap capture the materialities. Short of kind of following people like David around, I don't think you'd want to have a researcher following you around. Um, I think that I, I need more robust methods for looking at multimodality. We need entirely new assumptions about making and designing. I always argue we need a coupling of teachers with professionals, but that's a bit radical. There's the sticky issue of power and privilege and differentials that we don't talk about in multimodality, I don't think. And that is that lower SES students um, tend to be consumers of text because they don't have the trappings to be able to produce and design. Okay? That's very important and it's hazy at the moment and it's not foreground enough. Um, so to cross the Rubicon entails exposing and formalizing the craft of the maker. So thinking about professionals and thinking about the humanness of it. And it's time for a gateway to reimagine multimodal futures. All right, hi. I'll say good morning too. Good morning. Um, it's like NCTE. Um, I'd like to also thank Kevin for inviting me to the, take part in the session, and I'd like to thank David for uh, giving me the opportunity to read his wonderful work and also comment on it and hopefully do it some justice today. Um, today I'm talking a little bit about the approach of reading the comic itself. That's really what I'm thinking about. And of late, I've been looking at the comics and graphic novels and sequential art and how we comprehend them. And of recently we have a, a, a chapter coming out in this handbook of reading, re of reading comprehension. And in looking at the research on actually reading comics and what counts as comprehension in them, one thing that struck us in general is that when we talk about reading comprehension and we're talking about multimodality and these things don't they go together, but they don't often get discussed at the same time. And almost all the theories of reading comprehension involve some kind of visual aspect, but they don't talk about the visual itself. They don't talk about the imagery. It's always in service of the comprehension of the word and the literate kind of thing, but not so much about the image itself. So it strikes me that when we talk about multimodality, that Sometimes it's hard to make a connection between what it is that other people in this room or other people in this organization or this field talk about in terms of reading and understanding. Um, and you can see that. It's, it's gotten sh short shrift. So we put together some of the people that have been cited so far, and we talk about how you read a comic. And 
I have a representative page up there from a book called Rosalie Lightning um, that if you look at it, I have lots of like weird doodads off of there. But it's one page in the book. It's a very complicated um, set of things. If you look at the top five, four panels, those things there are in a different style than the, the ones at the bottom. The ones at the top are very cartoony and reference the artist's earlier work. Um, this book, if you've never read it, is about, a, probably you've never read it, it's about a student, not a student, it's about a couple, they lose their two-year-old child, and it's about how they deal with that loss. And it's a very heart-wrenching story, but I think what makes it work is that it plays with the conventions of comics in a very expert way. It depicts different moments in time using different styles and different aspects. So when you look at it, you see at the top, you know, that very cartoony style. At the bottom, there's an echoing of, of the moments where you see the daughter, she's very happy, she's watching a cartoon. She goes to the park, she picks up an acorn, she mentions that movie. Later in the book, the, the couple is walking through the woods and they see an acorn, they pick it up. That's the first panel on the bottom, it's very scratchy and dark. And when we talk about those, those things, uh, it's a different mode. There's a, there's a transformation of time and, and space, like we've been talking about. Um, where I've been thinking about this is talking about a, a couple of things. Um, one, the Leander and Bolt uh, piece that you've probably read about assemblages and about the need for pushing on multi-literacies and thinking about understanding and embodied and multi-sensory ways. Um, and also coupling that to me, looking at the Deleuze and Guattari, the, the Thousand Plateaus, that quotation about a rhizome and a rhizome as a system. And in this case, thinking of the system as literacy writ large. And they say any point in the rhizome can be connected to, and must be. So it's, um, Jennifer had that quote, you wanted the verb. We are in a world right now where things that we don't want to see or didn't expect to see or didn't think would ever possibly exist, exist. And those things have always existed and those things are always connected. It's that we choose to focus on what we choose to focus on. And I think in terms of the field, I'm thinking about the, the, the major theories that drive what we call literacy. And perhaps the need to, to step outside of those theories and to expand what we think of as literacy. So it makes me very excited to talk about this book um, because I love comics and I've been doing lots of research on comics. And this is a book that does the things that comics do. Um, they play with time and space. We talked about sequential art and David talked about the magic of comics. And there is, a, it's not a very research word, right? Magic, it sounds like, ooh, unicorns or something like that. But it's a magic, it's a thing. It's a, it's a very hard to define thing that happens. And this is a book, I was talking with David a little bit before this, it stars these historical figures like Nikola Tesla and Sandra, Sarah Bernhardt and Jules Verne. But the star of this book, in my, my opinion, and I kind of shared that with you, is not these people, it's time and space and history and they're all kind of swept up in the thing. They, they have actions and they do things, but to me, it's the, the flow of the thing that is the, what it is. And I'm gonna admit this, this is a horrible thing to say. Um, when I read this the first time, I was like, this is hard. It's a very difficult thing. Like, oh, this stuff is happening and it jumps back and forth through time and space. And I thought, oh, this is gonna be a tough go. And then what happened was I got through it. And then I went back and I said, oh, once you know the beats, the, the, the book itself is, it's wonderful. It's, it's, it's got all these fascinating parts. It's got all these minute details. It's got all these references on each other and, and, and to, to other aspects, other texts. I mean, I love the fact that there's, there's turtles in the, in the glass, um, it's the, the glass desert in the, 
Exactly. At the world's end, the glass desert, there's turtles with cities on it. It reminds me of that, you know, it's turtles all the way down. It's like that thing. It's, it's one of those, there's so much bound into it. And I think that's the part that gets lost. When I had that slide up about Serafini and all the things that are bound into reading comics, it's not just, I'm going to flip back. It's not just reading comprehension. It's not just going through the sequence. It's theory, it's, it's communication, it's history. There's other philosophical aspects. There's so much about being in the world that has to do with understanding and reading a comic. And what I wanted to do is, is talk about that in a few ways with reference to the book itself. So on this page, this is page 10, um, we see some events and I put these, I, I used orange because I'm from the University of Tennessee, go balls, and you need orange and things. Um, I pointed to this thing in the back and what that is, is the gateway. It's that in-between space that uh, Jennifer talked about. And what does that look like? David knows. <laughs> it looks like that. but conceiving of the unconceivable and what that should be is, is a difficult aspect that we think we have a, a, a handle on. Because if you look at the panels, you'll see some numbers. They're in yellow. Um, I don't have a pointer, but there's a one up there. There's a two. Like, we know when we do reading comprehension or when we do reading, we expect certain conventions, right? We go from left to right. We go from the top to the bottom. And with comics, we don't do that. And research from people that look at eye, eye tracking and things like that show that, in fact, most people that read comics don't start from left to right and do that. They, they go all over the place because they, 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 it's almost like gravity wells. They look at an image and then they look around it and they might skip the words or they might look at the words but then skip the pictures. There's no real rhyme or reason to it. And I mention this because I think this, this book is wonderful for, for two reasons, really. One, well, more than two reasons, but the two ones that I'm gonna talk about is that one, it plays with time and space. And it's a story that plays with time and space, which is eminently suited to something called comics, which we, the, the, the fancy word is sequential art. It's things that happen in a sequence. And the juxtaposition of those things um, captures so much. And I'm going to get a little bit more into that. Well, here, I'll do it over here. There's, a, there's also, oh, we'll see. On this panel here, this page, five, all right. On this page here, we have um, a fight. This is a battle. And one of the things I thought was fascinating was comics are words and images together, but really they're another thing, and they capture so much. One of the, the magical things about comics is that they don't move, and they don't make sound, but they capture both things and they communicate both things. Because we'll look at those pictures and you can look at that. That guy's shooting a ray gun. You know that that's happening. What's the sound of a ray gun being shot? It's a, th that. But according to the note, which I thought was fascinating, you wanted to translate it and you were thinking about manga conventions and how typically in manga, if, if you read those, the sound effects are in Japanese, but when it gets translated into the English, they still leave the sound effect in Japanese, and then there's, there's other things. So you look at it, and you're like, what? So what's the sound of a ray gun being shot? Or it's a laser, laser gun, I think, right? It's laser gun in Japanese, which is a homage to, uh, homage, I'll say it in the, that way, to the, the manga convention, right? And if you look around in there, what do you see? I mean, the other arrows that jagged white line all around there. What is that? That's action, it's adventure, it's something. Um, there's sound in there, there's the bam, bam, bam of the machine gun. There is the crackle, and the crackle isn't just, you know, they don't, he doesn't just have crackle written up in Courier or something like that. It's stylized, it looks like lightning, it looks like energy. And to me, all of this kind of points to um, the need to th think about comprehension in a different way. I'm very excited about this session because I think it 
it, it talks about how we need to talk of, of comprehension and conceive of understanding in ways that go beyond what we've been used to talking about, really. Um, this is not, this is a text, and it doesn't look like a poster session, uh, or it doesn't look like a poster. It looks like art, and it looks like things that have been juxtaposed. There are words and pictures, and that's always been the case when we talk about literate activity. It's just that we have chosen as a field to focus on the word. And to me, that's, that's a dangerous thing, in, especially in this time, because I think of how we get in our little holes and we start looking at things and we, we atomize it. So reading becomes five pillars and reading becomes those five things and not the multiplicity of things it can be. This book is inspiring and wonderful because it points to what reading is and has always been and what we've kind of lost in reducing it to words on a page and things that just kind of proceed in a very orderly fashion. That's not the case. We choose to put an order there and recognize that order and study that order, but that order, it's, it's arbitrary. We've done that. And it, I think we're in for some rude awakenings in some areas if we don't adjust our, our view of those things. So I figured talking about a book, we should also have some comprehension questions, right? Because that's what we do. Um, it made me think, what does time travel smell like? <laughs> um, and I say this because this is a weird thing. I was yesterday, I was under the weather yesterday, and I was reading this, and I kept, the door to the hotel kept opening, and I kept smelling mulch. And it was like the worst thing, because I felt ill, and then I'd smell mulch, and I was like, ugh, this is not good. And then I thought, this is perfect, because how would I feel like if I was in between time and in between space and lurching from like century to century to century, probably wouldn't be like, oh yeah, great, you know. It would make you feel like that, perhaps. Um, what can you see in the in-between? I mean, this blue crackly, th what is there? That's like an amazing thing. What would it be like to be between time? What does Nikola Tesla's voice sound like? He looks, like, he's so dapper. You're, you're a good model. Um, and what happens when you, re this is the other, other question, what happens when you read the book out of order? I love this book and it lends itself to reading it out of order very well because after I read it the first time I was like sweet now I can go around here and see what's happened here and see what happened here and we don't allow ourselves to do that with other texts and I don't know I think that that needs to be some dimension that we allow ourselves that I understand that a lot of the things that we are dealing with are serious but that sense of play and that sense of being able to step outside and do something different um, I think it's very necessary. And I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you. Any good morning, huh? It is, isn't it? Yeah. So, finally I find a podium which kind of shows me a little bit. <laughs> so I'm uh, going to change uh, whatever's been um, talked about so far a little bit. Um, so I'm going to talk about the power to manipulate minds and thought through futuristic graphic novels and superheroes, because that's what this is all about, right? Well, comic books have been around for ages. It's so many things have been covered by my... Um, uh, the people who have come before me and talked about this novel. Um, but what really stood out for me was the search for and presence of superheroes who saved the world from a chaotic end have been more and more visible in recent times within the genre of movies and books. Movies take these ideas and project it for a larger audience, thus emphasizing their impact for the greater public. Graphic novels are getting popular and have made a strong comeback. The method that I used for, well, I could have gone through and talked just about the method and the interaction between the efferent and the, um, you know, poetic uh, reading that I would, would, did do um, to find out more about this novel. But the method that I employed uh, in, um, 
in reading this was um, uh, a critical content analysis. Um, and I used certain concepts of multimodality as well. Um, so um, I took this um, a definition of critical content analysis and I used that. So it's the critical um, involves bringing um, a critical lens to the analysis of a text or a group of texts in an effort to explore the possible underlying messages within these texts, particularly in, uh, as related to issues of power. And within the parameters of this research, I actually took post-colonial theory and uh, defined criticality as a careful analytic examination and reflection on the graphic novel for studying concepts of imaginative geographies, othering, and the imperial gaze as constructs. And the, I, t uh, I take mediation between the visual and the verbal text very seriously and to analyze the symbiosis of both. This text demands intertextual analysis, especially in the intermingling of the visual and verbal text along with the real lived experiences of the two main characters. Um, in analyzing the text through multimodality, the meaning of the visual and the verbal text enmeshes and alters dramatically. The theoretical frame, again, um, of course, was the symbiosis of um, visual and verbal text discourse uh, within the graphic novel is strong, and it lends itself to the study, uh, to study the implication of colonial imaginary that permeates the modern world and rejects the notion of the end of colonialism. To observe imaginative geographies, imperial gaze, and concept of othering, that is from Said, it became necessary to use post-colonial theory to explore issues of power within the text that speak to the power discourse that gives Western nations their prominence. And according to Said, he says, none of us is completely free from the struggle over geography. And we, we have seen it so much more in the recent times than in just the past times. The struggle is complex and interesting because it is not only about soldiers and cannons, but also about ideas, about forms, about images and imaginings. So the three concepts that I took were imaginative geography, the, the gaze, and othering uh, from the post-colonial theory. Um, so this is, of course, as uh, David said, it is from the genre of steampunk, and it brilliantly emphasizes an, as an, an assimilation of past, present, and future of the world, planet Earth, and the struggle for its control by the two main characters. Reality and fic uh, fiction intermingle to create a colorful, action-packed, chaotic narrative that stresses the significance of Western dominant thought control over the future of the world. <laughs> Crossing the Rubicon reflects a point of no return. That is a concept that is challenged within the story because they do cross over and they, uh, they come back. Um, so, there's no doubt that this work is a work of art and that it has a strong literary merit with the detailed settings and the forms that function. Now, uh, with the forms that function, I mean, of course, the frames that um, we have already heard about and how the bleeds are used and the kraken is put in the corner and you kind of um, have that joint. Um, it actually directs the gaze towards how the... the the book is written and how the page needs to be followed by the reader. Authentic dialogue, expressive characters, detailed in visual setting. So all this makes it worthy of any kind and every kind of um, analysis. Um, the themes, the three themes that emerged from my analysis were dominant societal perspectives and power control over space, time and life, gaze, knowledge and power, and the reality of women, and the absent, invisible, thus othering. Theme, the reality of it is that Nikola Tesla, Sarah Bernard, and uh, Jules Verne were real, uh, real live um, uh, people who still have impact on um, uh, our thinking, I think. Uh, so he, Tesla, Serbian American inventor, electrical engineer, he was so many things. Then Sarah Bernard, on the other hand, was just a French actress and her character is completely taken and I think she has been given the role of her life in this. Um, <laughs> Jules, Jules Verne, because she becomes a feminist. Um, Jules Verne, French born, um, he was no, a novelist, uh, poet and playwright. And now I know that David's son is named after Jules. Yeah, uh, the, this is how they looked in real life. So 
The fiction is that Tesla belongs to the US, Verne to France. Both cross over, decohere, and recohere with the Rubicon's power that connects past, present, and future, but do not age or regress in age. Tesla has an eternal life and is, is res resurrected after death by his own brother who heads the evil brotherhood organization. Tesla also sires a son, which comes, uh, confirms his permanent presence. Verne is dramatically re resurrected for a short time by Aureus. Tesla is represented as a fast talker, forever fixing, creating things as he goes through the various climaxes within the text. Tesla also does not lose control, even knowing that he will be killed dramatically by Aureus because of a vision he saw while crossing over. The graphic novel seems a great tribute to Tesla. Imaginated geographies and perceptions of gaze. The manner in which this graphic novel unfolds brings issues of dominant societal thought to the fore within the power to control the future of the world by Western individuals who may control the mindset of the popular culture to this day. Said's key geographical themes and interest in speciality and power are thoughtful and strong and in analyzing this text. Gregory says demands, um, it, he demands further linkages between culture and politics, between the imaginative and the physical through which power, knowledge, and geography are drawn together in acutely physical ways. In general, scopic regimes are constituted through grids of power, desire, and knowledge, and their visual structures and practices enter intimately into the production of imaginative geographies. Masterful gaze of detached authorities. Short contends that the new medium of photography, images, was employed in very, various ways to establish imperial control, extend imperial connections, and articulate imperial identity. This idea of a scopic regime of visual images is deeply involved in the process of colonial hegemony, affirming and reconstituting the physical appropriation of space. We need to take into account Haraway's conception of situated, situated knowledge, where she argues that where the gaze is premised upon illustrates the difficulties of achieving geographical objectivity and passivity, thus informing us that subjectivity in how we view the world is impossible. And I posit here that images are where facts in visual form are stored and communicated, ordered and conceptualized, reconstituted and transformed by an imperial gaze into the myths of metaphors of place and identity. Further mainstream ways of seeing makes the dominant culture view their own imperial power. And we see these three images which were very significant for me because this is Tesla actually viewing his own death and he's nonchalant about it. Then you see him dead where um, in the central image and the frame is small on the verso page and the recto page is completely left blank so it seems an end to the novel but then it continues where he is resurrected and comes back and this is the actual final the third panel is the actual final ending of the story in which his son is asking why is he calling him son and um, he has this smug expression on his face and it says span so again using french so i mean it continues it is a postmodern ending and it is left to the audience to decide what exactly happened after that. Okay, here is where um, Tesla is addressing the summit and he is foreshadowing the reality of today by saying, no longer will we be separated by boundaries of state and economy. It is time to stop the ravishing of our planet for the benefit of a few privileged amongst us. Free, free, he also talks about free wireless energy for all the world, so it's really coming to life right now. And then on the second panel, he says, imagine never growing old. So basically, he's talking about controlling. Um, okay, this is the third theme, is the theme of othering. Women are created as a secondary characters, uh, emotionally or physically dependent on men. Uh, Maureen, Vern's mute daughter, Sarah, a pod for pregnancy to carry Tesla's child. Aureus, hybrid and confused personality, a part of who loves Tesla. The absence of multiple thought leads to, of, uh, to othering of the absent invisible people within the text. Okay, and this is a vision of, um, uh, you know, uh, Sarah Bernard and uh, Maureen and um, Tesla fixing her, her hand. So, being critical in reading this text is an imperative to appreciate the subliminal, visual, metaphorical and real messages that are embedded in its visual, verbal representation. The play of power relationships 
that encompasses this brilliantly colorful and vivid world of a futuristic text projects dominance of one kind of people from the past to present and then into a shaky future. It therefore points towards colonial, post-colonial concerns and issues. Further, the main protagonist pro projects an imperialistic viewpoint within their actions and narrative structures and the plot. So basically, um, what it presents is the West as a savior. Um, we live in an increasingly visual world where verbal and visual meet and mate. Nodelman and Meek posit that placing words and pictures into relationships with each other inevitably alters their meaning so that they are more than the sum of their parts. Um, mainstream media, social and other wild projects, um, a certain way of viewing, viewing the world which proposes a dominant perspective. Bart's considers Western culture's dependency on beliefs of constancy and ultimate standards to be weak. He further argues that there is no meaning that is inherent or natural. Meanings alter with a varied connotation of the object or action. In analyzing this novel, I came away with the understanding that the perception of the world as a playground for the privileged few is an ongoing rhetoric. As Massey posits, there's still the perception among some people that geography is boys conquering the world by various strange means. TV programs can give this image, but also because it's such a disrespectful view of the planet, not only to the people already there, but also because it resonates with that imperialistic view that we can have a right to go anywhere and treat the world as our playground. I believe that Jangs powerfully scaffolds criticality when she says critical in front of any of these literacies um, emphasizes power and requires us to understand the social effects of text and practices. Power, identity, diversity, access and design making are interrelated. Using redesign as or transformation as an agentive act would create a more transformed, diverse and just world where meanings shift and transcend but there where there is a world not only ruled by the dominant thought and imaginings, but where everyone has a presence and a voice. By fusing Foucault's concepts of power, knowledge, and Bath's concepts of connotation with Said's theoretical framework, it becomes more comprehensible to interpret this piece of verbal and visual text through an ideological perspective. Massey's reading of the world as a playground can do much to dispel the notion of the post in post-colonialism, and the irony of such a concept lends itself to a greater and continued emphasis upon the present-day working of the colonial ideology through the medium of a graphic novel. Thank you. So I also want to thank Kevin for the invitation and uh, David for the opportunity to engage in this beautiful work of art. Uh, and I want to return quickly to uh, Jennifer's talk and her uh, description of multimodality at the center of a number of swirling turns, uh, which I really love that image, one of which includes an affective turn. And I also want to uh, return to, to Jennifer's uh, idea that there needs to be a deep, deep respect for the history of uh, multimodality and there needs to be a deep respect for uh, the rational process of design and the expert process of design. But at the same time, we need better understandings of the emotional and the affective and the irrational life of creating this, this art um, that, that multimodality or traditional theories of multimodality don't always uh, capture that well. Um, and it's so, it's, it's with that deep respect um, that I want to begin today with uh, Gunter Kress and the social semiotic theories of multimodality that have informed much of what we've done. So Kress's 2010 book, uh, Developing a Social Semiotic Theory of Multimodality, theorizes meaning from a revised perspective, which he argues marks a move away from abstractions such as language, the linguistic system, and grammar, and toward materiality. This move, he argues, uh, makes it possible to link the means of representation with the bodiliness of humans, not only in the physiology of seeing and hearing, of sight and seeing, of touching and feeling, of taste and tasting, but also in the fact that humans make meaning through all of these means, and the fact that all of these are linked and make meaning together. 
Beyond that, the focus on materiality offers the ability of seeing meaning as embodied, as in our bodies, a means of getting beyond separations of those other abstractions, mind and body, of affect and cognition. As an example, Kress extends Wittgenstein's description of a chess match, where two players begin setting up a game only to find that one piece is missing. Kress reads Wittgenstein's description as illustrating both the strength of social convention and the arbitrary relationship between form and meaning. If we imagine that the two chess players agree to play with, say, a small button to replace the missing piece, a pawn or a work perhaps, but Kress pushes further still to argue for the necessity of considering the material nature of the sign and choosing the chess piece. Uh, at that level, it comes to matter that the pawn lies flat on the board, is awkward to pick up, and takes away even if slightly from my pleasure of playing the game, Kress says. My pleasure lessens. Something is different, missing. The material chess piece carved or cast has a tangibility and an aesthetic which has an effect on me materially as a body in the world with experiences embodied, a materiality that adds to my pleasure in playing the game. I might much prefer to play with pieces with a certain dimensionality, weight, texture, aesthetic, and which for reason of those qualities gives me pleasure. The sensory, effective, and aesthetic is too often ignored and treated as ancillary. Crest does not parse out the meanings of aesthetic, sensory, or, or effective, which I think in this passage, which I, I cherry-picked, of course, so I, I, sorry, Gunter, um, uh, seem conflated. Even still, the decided attention to the real material world of signs and the embodied experience of the sign interpreters and makers points to open questions about how to investigate the aesthetic, effective, and embodied experiences of, for example, students' experiences with multimodal texts like the anomaly. The effective and aesthetic dimensions of semiosis that appear here remain ancillary questions in much research involving adolescents' multimodal literacies, though, as Kress argues, they seem an essential feature of a semiotic landscape. I argue that one reason for Kress's vexation in this chess match with affect had to do with a representational impulse to search for meaning in texts themselves, rather than where the texts send us searching rather than in how and where they move us in our bodies. Non-representational theory does not begin with a search for the smallest units accreting into larger scale compositions like Cress's chessboard. As Canadian process philosopher and affect theorist Brian Masumi put it recently, how big is red? As big as it comes, as small as it gets. As wide as a sunset, as in as bitsy as a pixel. What size is pain? Non-representational theory is interested in degrees of intensity and capacities to move and be moved. Musumi takes this point further, and so going, hits at the heart of the distinction between representational and non-representational logics. The bit-by-bit -bit constructionist model uh, implicitly assumes everything it is ostensibly designed to explain. The lofty eye atop is surreptitiously assumed in advance, below the ground level, at which the account begins. It prefigures as a receiver of impressions, a lumper together of construction material, like the pieces on the chessboard. In addition to this underground subject, there is an implicit assumption of a pre-given material world prior to and physically outside of experience. So on the one hand, representational logic and a social semiotics of multimodality require a process of back formation that searches for now only in what has been. On the other hand, non-representational logic meets the past as it emerges in its singular newness. Consider Deleuze and Guattari's example of the affective qualities of social life that require such non-representations to knowing. They contrasted the qualities of feeling of stepping off a train in the bustle of a central station at five o'clock in the morning on a winter Monday with passing the threshold at home as twilight falls at five o'clock in the afternoon, while all the neighborhood, all through the neighborhood, a nation of televisions flicker on to keep company in the night, right? So the two, the two ideas of five o'clock in the, in the morning, five o'clock in the evening, this is the quality of five o'clock. These qualities of five o'clock have intensity and feeling that resist representation, that resist stability. 
They resist scales and structures that can be easily parsed and portrayed in pieces. Or as Masumi puts it, you could analyze these situations by decomposing them into any number of component parts. And if you take an honest look at your analytic parts, you quickly sense that the quality is not in any of them, the quality of five o'clock. Separate out any of those parts and the quality dissipates. What signs represent is not what sends non-representational theorists searching. It's the quality of signs. It's the quality of signs that moves us and that increase our capacities to move others and our own sign making. It's the quality of the sign of five o'clock in the evening that feels like home in a way that representational searching is not equipped to find. So what does this mean for literacy research and what has it meant? What does this non-representational searching mean? And what might it continue to mean? Although non-representational thinking and feeling is still very new to literacy studies, multiple researchers have asked just this, for instance, also comparing the design perspectives of multimodality with non-representational theory, including Kevin's work with, with Gail Bolt. This research has argued that non-representational theory, uh, view, non-representational views of youth, engagement, and literary activity provokes generous, ebullient, and vivid accounts of literacy that are elided by less embodied, effective, and representational perspectives. Contrasting uh, a multi-literacy's design perspective with a non-representational perspective on Emily, a young writer, while she wrote a series of young adult graphic, uh, graphic novels, Smith argued that a non-representational perspective allowed her to see the young composer's process as effective, emergent, and experimental, and how everyday experiences with text, even when they occur on the phenomenological periphery, impact their doing of literacy moment to moment. Similarly, Leander and Bolt employed a non-representational perspective to describe Lee, a 10-year-old boy's experiences reading and playing with text from Japanese manga as an activity that is saturated with affect and emotion, and that creates and is fed by an ongoing series of affective intensities that are different from the rational control of meanings and forms. This building movement that includes the work of many others and, and many in the room uh, is expressing singular qualities of the life of multimodal literacies that is moving toward a new understanding of how literacy activity moves us in our shared humanity. But how can we develop and redevelop concepts related to multimodality through a non-representational perspective in order to feel what Leander and Bolt called an ongoing series of affective intensities that are different from the rational control of meanings and forms? How do we know the irrational and literate activity when all of our methods are so rational? In the remainder of my time, I'm going to attempt to express the feeling of rethinking one such non-representational concept related to multimodality, the sign. And so I'm not going to review all of the non-representational concept that this paper integrates. Instead, I want to think closely about just one with you here today and really feel with you, the sign. And we will think and feel together about this through a passage from Proust. I was an English teacher. I cannot, uh, I can't pass up the opportunity to read a long passage of literature with such a large group. Sorry. Uh, so we're going to think about this closely the, through a passage from Proust. Uh, through Deleuze's uh, notion of the sign, through his reading of Proust, and how I encountered a sign and the anomaly. The passage is uh, from volume three of Proust in Search of Lost Time. Uh, if you have your books out, you can open them up. Yeah. As you read through this passage, I want you to imagine Proust's narrator as actually critiquing a representational and over-rational approach to understanding signs and their meanings. The truth that intelligence grasps directly in the open light of day, you can think of truths almost as signs, have something less profound, less necessary about them than those life has communicated to us in spite of ourselves, in spite of our, our rationalized methods, and an impression, a material impression, because it has reached us through our senses, but whose spirit we can extract. I would have to try to interpret the sensations as the signs of so many laws and ideas Right, pointing to something really meaningful and abstract, these signs. But attempting to think, that is, to bring out of the darkness what I have felt and convert it into a spiritual equivalent. 
Whether this was a matter of reminiscences of the kind that included the noise of the fork or the taste of the madeleine, or of those truths written with the help of figures whose meaning I was trying to discover in my mind, their first character was that I was not free to choose them, that they were given to me as they were, a quality, like five o'clock. And I felt that this must be the mark of their authenticity. I had not gone looking for five o'clock, right, for the two cobblestones of the courtyard where I had stumbled, but precisely the fortuitous and inevitable way in which the sensation had been encountered governed the truth of the past that it res resuscitated, of the images that it released, because we feel its effort to rise toward the light, because we feel the joy of reality regained. Sorry, I just got to, got to move along with you. Hopefully you had your books out. For Proust's narrator, the signs of lost time, of time past, of qualities of life, spark desiring for finding more life. I had not gone looking for the two cobblestones of the courtyard where I had stumbled, he said. I had gone looking for past experiences, as we all do, and searching through our memories, our idiosyncratic past moments that mean something to us searching through our memories for the singularities of our experiences that have moved us, but that cannot be re-experienced in those singularities. His desires to re-experience is the affect of the sign of lost time. The meaning is not in the cobblestones and the famous madeleines of the first volume, but it is in their affects. The signing of the sense of lost time that we feel as a condition of our humanity. The Madeleine and lost time are one and the same. One does not represent the other. One affects the other in an irrational and desiring searching for something, something human, something that evokes a condition of our humanity. When I was reading David's book, uh, I got all when I was reading David's book, I got all the way to the end before I had an academic oh no moment. I hadn't taken any notes. I was, uh, I was just enjoying the story as a story, right? Until something forced me to think. A cobblestone, a madeleine, a sign at the end of the novel. Something sent me searching. In this penultimate scene, a character able to time travel kills another character and thereafter travels back in time to apologize and become a different self. I think I've got this right. Uh, Remember me for what I became, this character says Nick, and not for the cruelness that I was. Forgive me and know that I will one day learn to forgive you. I love you, Nick. I was forced to think of all the moments I would travel back to, of the desiring to right mundane wrongs and everyday daydreaming of righting those wrongs and the singularities of experience that I felt intensely in the moments that I lived them. As Proust's narrator puts it, but precisely the fortuitous and inevitable way in which the sensation had been encountered governed the truth of the past that it resuscitated, of the images that it released, because we feel its effort to rise toward the light, because we feel the joy of reality regained. I think of this as almost something that happens between the lines, right, and the, between the comic book panels. This sort of response to a sign is not rational. It cannot be understood through the parsing of modes and their orchestration to understand how the text compels it. Here, color, facial expression, the design grammar of graphic novels. Hence, a deeply uh, and deceptively simple way of knowing signs in a non-representational theory of multimodality. What forces us to think is the sign. What is signed is the nature of our searching. And so I wanna leave you uh, with the last thought, and if I'm gonna take my argument seriously, then I need to leave you with a feeling. I need to leave you with a sign. Uh, so I want to leave you with a thought about the potential of non-representational theory in literacy studies uh, that refuses to parse experiences into component parts or pare away the intensities of experience that can be as painful as joyful. Essayist and novelist Marilyn Robinson wrote, there is so much humanity that to disburden ourselves of ourselves is an understandable temptation. So many voices, so many worlds, we can weary of them. If there were only one human query to be heard in the universe, and it was the sort of thing we are always inclined to wonder about, where did all this come from? Or why could we never refrain from war? We would hear it in a beauty that would overwhelm us. We would feel a barely tolerable loneliness, hers and ours, 
And if there were another hearer, not one of us, how starkly that hearer would apprehend what we are and were. And it's sort of in that paradox, right? That paradox of the feeling of loneliness, but also of collectivity, right? That you feel your humanity in a way that we can't represent, right? Sort of in between the lines of panels. That signs voice, right? That signs human. For me, this quote signs the irreducible qualities of experience that non-representational perspectives on literacy research have the potential to lead us to. Youth, like, like us and like me, are moved or not moved uh, by texts. They are sent searching and desiring or they're not. If we are successful in our non-representational expressions of youth, uh, and we are successful in this affective turn, of youths becoming capacities to move and be moved by text, then we might become yet better teachers of literacy. We help to send our students searching with and through texts throughout their lives for what moves us as human beings. And if we are further successful in assigning all this movement to each other and writing and our writing together and in our talks, then we might send each other searching in the field for more and more experiences with youth and their moving literacies, whose beauty might overwhelm us. Thanks. <clears throat> so that, we are going to be pulling that all together into a chapter, um, and that, at that moment, I'm sure you're saying, I'm glad I'm not you, um, but we'll, we'll be writing this up as an interpretation of this work and sort of pointing in some directions in multimodality, but I'm gonna ask if I could please to have the, the comment, those that offered their comments in the, and David, to just, if you just pull up your chair here for a moment. We have a little bit of time for, for questions. Um, and as they're setting up um, to take a page out of uh, Pat and Cecil's playbook, I wanted to say that I was especially happy to have my daughter Jackie here today. So, um, yeah. I don't have eight family members, but thanks for coming, Jackie. Um, so, um, <laughs> I think uh, I'll just serve as, as moderator for this part, and uh, please, um, I understand there's not a session following this, so um, stay as long as, 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 we'll stay as long as you want to and, and address any, any questions or comments that, that you have right now. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, overwhelmed. This is amazing, um, especially because this was such a long-term project. Sorry, should I speak into the microphone? Uh, especially because this was such a long-term project for me that that consumed like my entire life for almost five years. Um, <clears throat> this is just overwhelming to me. Just um, the acknowledgement of, of the project and and just. Um, these amazing people that, that analyze the work and, and um, I just, I'm overwhelmed with joy right now. <laughs> it's just, this is incredible. Um, and even some of the, the criticism is like, it was dead on. It really is, you know, they, they pointed out a lot of the shortcomings that, that even that I saw in myself while creating um, this work and um, it's, it's great. I'm loving this. Yes, Pat. <laughs> One thing that, uh, that happened while, while creating the story is th my friends who, who acted out the characters, who modeled the characters, 
they changed in a way the representation of the characters um, in the story because their personalities actually came out in, in the characters, uh, especially in um, Aureus and in um, Jules Verne. Um, that was actually a, a married couple, <laughs> um, Michael and, and, and Bex, um, who, who modeled those two characters. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and so they, who they were as actors, as models, actually changed my perception of the characters that I was creating for the story. And um, it was is interesting seeing them. So in in uh, in February, when we put on on the big show of the the entire display, um, and we actually had those care uh, those friends of mine dressed in their costumes in character walking around interacting with people. And so um, people could ask them questions if they wanted to, take pictures with them. They would just stand there and be like a three-dimensional um, character that you could interact with and, and, and see the, the details. Because there was a lot of details that were put into the costuming that some of it didn't show up in, in some of the paintings, especially you know when you're painting a character that's really small in a, in a larger scene, you can't get like some of the details of the, the stitching on, on a patch. You know, for, you know, things like that. And you got to see that and interact with it um, in real life at the, at the show with, with the actual characters. Um, is that, is, am I answering your question or? Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay, yeah, uh, so at, at, the, at the show, at, at the big d display of the whole thing, like, I'm not, I'm not sure that the characters um, talked like in character, there was more, more of just like being there in character. I don't think they were like deep reading their dialogue. That would be a really interesting um, thing. I've actually gone to a reading of a graphic novel um, that was here in Nashville, and that was fantastic, where they had um, radio voice actors reading out with sound effects a graphic novel. Um, and it was, it was just a whole new experience. Yeah. Um. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and that was something that was really surprising to me that I didn't expect to see because I, I guess going into it, I expected everyone, like you're describing, to just walk through and individually, you know, read it like you read a book. Um, and what I experienced instead, and I didn't overhear anyone's conversations. Um, I wasn't that intimate in, into people's experiences, but I did see a lot of people that were experiencing it together. Um, people that would show up in, in groups, whether they were families or friends, and um, like the image that I put up there of, of those two friends that just walked through with their arms around each other and like, experiencing it together, and I saw a group of, I think it was like four people that were walking through, reading it aloud to each other. Um, just seeing the way that, that an audience can step outside of their own boundaries 
because it, with with traditional books, we we kind of create a boundary for ourselves, and we'll, we'll you know we'll go into a cafe or uh, a library or bookstore or whatever, and we'll we'll sit in our comfy little couch, you know, with our book, and we'll find our our comfort zone. So this experience kind of took people out of their comfort zone and forced people to interact more with each other in an intimate um, type of situation such as comic books offer where you and your own experiences, like I said, fill in the blanks between the panels. So when you force people to, not forcing, but <laughs> you allow, there you go, you allow people to experience that together you're breaking down that wall between them that they've put up around themselves and they get to know each other a little bit better, I think. And that's what I saw. Even though I wasn't able to like intimately hear what they were saying, I could see it in the way that they were interacting is that there was more bonding going on in the reading process, in the experiencing process. Is that Raul? I imagine there's a lot of blah up here, but um, <laughs> let, let, me, let, me, let me give it like a really quick kind of thing. So, because it struck me as an irony here is that these researchers and commentators, theorists were asked to, to talk about an event and what they got was a book in the mail, yeah? And so they got a book in the mail and there's very practical reasons why we have books that go in the mail that capture events, yeah? And so, um, and then they're signaling back to the event. So I think I'm wanting to connect to, you know, Pat's comments and Brian's comments around the, the dramatic aspects of it, right? Which is, it's not a, a new thing, but I think these transformations from, from the event to the book and back out again to the event, and these, these ways in which the modalities take on forms of materiality in different ways, and that we have those, that capacity as, as literacy um, teachers to, to bring out the materiality of the text, to make the text again a happening, an event. Does anybody else want to? I'm just gonna hold mine, so. <laughs> I mean, I think if anything, this session and, and, and thinking about it, it, it's more about doing things in the moment. And I think that in education we tend to, like I, I get what you're saying about this being, uh, you know, an event, and, and I was bummed because I did get the book, and no offense. I was like, I thought this was going to be an art installation, and I got a book. But it's like, you know, it's like when you go to a museum exhibit and you get the, you know, I've done it. I buy the program. I'm like, this is amazing, and I take it home, and it sits in a shelf or in a drawer, and I never look at it again. And I think part of the reason why that happens is because I'm a book person. I mean, I'm that's that's, and I'm, I'm imagining most of us are. But I think we put a lot of stock in that thing, and we detract from our experience in the moment. And to me, if I think about what to bring to a classroom, more and more, it's moments where we're in the moment and we create, and students make something and they respond to it. And it's not just, let's get Ethan Frohm out and because that's what we've been reading, or Kill a Mockingbird, or whatever, because that's something, like, we, we, we rely so much on things that are, like, set in stone, like, 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 
very distinct moments in time. And I get it because it's education and we want to have touchstones and we want some common things and we're trying to break it down so that um, we can translate things that we know and impart our wisdom to the young people. But when we do that, we make the illusion that these things are all set and that they're going to step in and just take over what we've been doing. And that's not the world we live in anymore. Everybody makes and does. And unless they get that in their heads, that they're makers and doers, then they're not going to, they're not gonna learn, they're not gonna change. They're just gonna look at what we do. And I mean, that's been the problem in education for millennia, if not, you know, not long. You know, it's like people look at teachers and they're like, blah, 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 teacher, 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 I'm gonna go home and do what I wanna do. Why don't we do what they wanna do in school or do what the group wants to do in school some, instead and rely on texts that kind of way, the student created text and make moments instead of just looking at past moments and reflecting on them again and again and again, which I know Proust made a beautiful thing out of it, but it gets a little bit like, oh, dude, come on, it was a cookie. Anyway, <laughs> thanks. Question? Yeah. Karen, yeah. Did you want to comment on that? Yeah, yeah, just a, a quick comment on that. That's fantastic. Uh, so color was a really big thing in, in creating this. Uh, first of all, obviously, color has a lot of stimulation um, to us. It, it represents a lot of feelings, depending on, on what colors you use to represent things. Uh, for me, for this story, I used color to separate geography and time. I didn't, for myself as a comic artist and writer, and I don't put this on anyone else, this is just my own thing. Um, I feel that if I have to narrate 
the visuals, then I've failed as a visual artist. So if I have, so there, there's comic books that literally describe in, in, in the narration what you're looking at. And that's fine for some artists, but I feel for myself, like, if I can't actually represent that visually, then I've failed as a visual artist, even though I could just write it in, in the narration as well. So I wanted to, as much as possible, take out all the narration and just have dialogue and visuals, um, except where it was completely necessary, as in saying what year it was. Um, and so I decided, in order to represent separations be visually, since I'm not actually going to write it out in the narration, I used color to separate between the different times and, and places um, geography-wise. So. Yeah, if you saw the whole thing, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. So I think what I'd say, Karen, is that there are people doing that really cool stuff stuff online using different programs. I think Jensen and De Castell have, have a program to look, do multimodal coding. But my answer is always a bit old school, which is that when I work with youth, you sit beside them and you talk through the choices. So mm -hmm. that's kind of, you know, I would sit beside David and I talk about why he did that because I wouldn't have known that actually. So, yeah. Thank you very much for coming to the session, for ending your LRA with us in this uh, research review session. And thanks again to David for sharing his work with us, to the panelists for their commentary. Um, just maybe close giving them a round. So, I just, I just, I, where is LRA next year? I can't remember. Tampa. All right, so there have to, I, I know there's music in Tampa, I know there are artists in Tampa, I know there's race relations in Tampa, so a challenge out to the Tampa host to help us find those people in those places, okay. All right, thanks. Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan. Yeah.